100% of his brain given by the almighty Allah Taala. He is very brilliant, very convincing. I like it. He is a good speaker. That's the reason I am here again. He is very knowledgeable, very exciting. He enthuses. That's the great thing about him. I am actually very verbal opponent of uh, Islam. I have met him personally and we uh, discussed for three hours nearly and I found his, uh, him a person of very uh, sharp mind. I thought that he won't be able to answer or he will be very jumbled. Whole of my idea went in vain. I appreciate his effort. Well, there is no comment for doctor. He is a very great philosopher, excellent uh, person. His way of explaining the things are marvelous. Any layman can also understand him. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin the program with the recitation from the Holy Quran by Qari Rehan Ghalib, followed by its English translation by Brother Ashraf Muhammadi. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل ادعوا الله أو ادعوا الرحمن أيما تدعوا فله الأسماء والله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس 
السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم صدق The translation from Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 110. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan, the accursed. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Say, call upon Allah or call upon Rahman. By whatever name you call upon him, it is well. For to him, belong the most beautiful names. The translation from Surah Al-Hashr, chapter 59, verses 22 to 24. Allah is He, than whom there is no other God, who knows all things, both secret and open. He, most gracious, most merciful. Allah is He, than whom there is no other God, the Sovereign, the Holy One, the source of peace and perfection, the guardian of faith, the preserver of safety, the exalted in might, the irresistible, the supreme. Glory to Allah, high is He, above the partners, the attribute to Him. He is Allah the creator, the evolver, the bestower of forms or colors. To him belong the most beautiful names. Whatever is in the heavens and on earth does declare his praises and glory. And he is the exalted in might, the wise. Verily, Allah has spoken the truth. Now we have 
the recitation from the Holy Vedas by Pandit Neeraj Shastri, Pandit Chandrapal Shastri, and Pandit Hariyom Shastri. All three are from the Arya Samaj, Mumbai. शांति की कामना ओम जो शांति मंत्रों का मनुष्य समाज के कल्याण के लिए परमेश्वर ने जो ध्यान दिया उसको हमने आपके सामने मंत्रों को प्रस्तुत किया धन्यवाद थैंक यू द ट्रांसलेशन बाय ब्रदर अशरफ मोहम्मदी वर्सेस रिसाइटेड बाय द प्रीस्ट द ट्रांसलेशन ऑफ टू ऑफ दीज वर्सेस इज इन फ्रंट ऑफ यू द फर्स्ट set of shlokas were from rigved book 1 hymn 164 mantra 46 it reads god is one but the wise call him by various names to denote his different attributes they call him indra god of supreme power or lord of the world mitra the friend of all varuna the most desirable supreme being agni the all knowing supreme leader divya the shining one and garutman the mighty universal spirit the rishis describe the one being in various ways calling him agni self refulgent one yama the ordainer of the world and matari shwan the life energy of the universe the next shlok was from yajurved chapter 40 verse 1 it says enveloped by the lord must be this all each thing that moves on earth with that renounced enjoy yourself covet not wealth of any man thank you dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum may peace be on you i dr mohammed naik am your host and coordinator for this evening's program i welcome 
each one of you to this momentous event, an event with a difference, the difference being similarities, similarities between Hinduism and Islam. It's perhaps for the first time in the history of modern India that we are holding a talk of such vital relevance. A talk that attempts to bring to common terms the followers of this great nation's two major religions, Hinduism and Islam. An educative talk that will try to dispel misconceptions and promote understanding about the common teachings of Hinduism and Islam. My school principal had once told me, the law of the jungle is kill or be killed. But the law of life is live and let live. It's a tragedy. So many of us choose to live by the law of the jungle. We choose blind hate over compassion and understanding. Fallible falsehood over transparent truth. It's sad we cannot live together amicably many a times. Understand our similarities. Learn to live with our differences. No wonder somebody once remarked, men will wrangle for religion, fight for it, die for it, anything but live for it. Tonight, like brothers in humanity, let's learn to live and let live. But this is possible only if we understand each other's perspectives, beliefs, and religions. Surprisingly, both Hinduism with its 850 million followers and Islam with its 1,300 million followers remain mysteries in the minds of many. Tonight, we have before us the internationally acclaimed orator on comparative religion, Dr. Zakir Naik. Dr. Zakir is a medical doctor. His critical analysis and convincing answers are founded on fact, since he quotes verbatim from various religious scriptures like the Noble Quran, the Holy Bible, and the ancient Vedas. In the last seven years, Dr. Zakir has delivered more than 700 public speeches in various countries worldwide, including the USA, Canada, UK, Saudi Arabia, UAE, South Africa, Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and Guyana in South America, in addition to numerous public talks in India. He appears regularly on many international TV channels in over 150 countries. This evening, he would be highlighting the similarities between Hinduism and Islam before us. May I present before you all, brothers and sisters in humanity, Dr. Zakir Naik.
الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ و اعلیٰ علی صاحب اجمعین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم کل یا اہل الکتاب تعال و علاقم تن سوا ام بن نبین کم اللہ نقد اللہ ولا نشرق بھی ہی سیوں ولا یتخذ باد و نباد و اربا بن من اللہ فن طول فقول شدو بینا مسلم رب شہلی صدری و یسر علی عمری و حل العقد تمل ثانی یف کا حکوری مائی رسپیکٹ ریلڈرس اینڈ مائی ڈیئر بردرز اینڈ سسٹرس آئی ویلکم آل آف یو ود اسلامک گریٹنگ السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ میں پیس مرسی اینڈ بلیسنگس آف اللہ سبحان و تعالی آف آل مائی گاڈ بی آن آل آف یو The topic of this evening's talk is similarities between Hinduism and Islam. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Glorious Quran from Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Kul, ya hilal kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'alo ila kalmatin sawa imbahina bainakum, come to common terms as between us and you. which is the first term allah na'buda illallah that we worship none but one almighty god wala nushrika bihi shay'an that we associate no partners with him wala yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min dunillah that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than allah fain tawallu if then they turn back faqulu shadu say e be witness be anna muslimun that we are muslims bowing our will to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this verse though it specifically refers to the ahle kitab to the jews and christians in general it can be used for people of different faiths and according to me it is the best verse that can be used while speaking with different kinds of people it says ta'alu ila qalmatin sawa im bainana bainakum come to common terms as between us and you which is the first term Allah na'buda illallah that we worship none but one almighty god wala nushrika bihi shay'an that we associate no partners with him wala yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min dunillah that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than one almighty god it is not appropriate to try and understand a particular religion by trying to observe the followers of that religion because many a times the followers they themselves are not aware about the teaching of their religion therefore the best and the most appropriate method of trying to understand any religion is to try to understand the authentic sources of that religion the authentic scriptures of that religion if you have to understand hinduism you have to try and understand the sacred scriptures of hinduism the most sacred are the vedas and the shlokas were recited from these scriptures that is supplemented by the upanishads by the ithihas ramayan mahabharat bhagavad gita by the puranas manusmriti etc but the most sacred are the vedas amongst all the hindu scriptures so if you have to understand hinduism you have to try and understand the sacred scriptures of hinduism similarly in islam the most sacred scripture is the glorious quran which is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of almighty god which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him it is supplemented with the authentic hadith the sayings and the traditions of prophet muhammad peace be upon him so if you have to understand islam you have to try and understand the glorious quran and the authentic hadith of the prophet i would like to give the definitions of the word Hinduism and Islam. Let's understand the definition of the word Hindu. Hindu is a geographical definition which refers to the people living beyond the river Sindhu or the people living in the land watered by river Indus. According to historians This word Hindu was first used by the Persians when they came to India through 
the northwestern passes of Himalaya. It was also used by the Arabs. According to the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, it is mentioned in volume number six, reference number 699, that the word Hindu is not found in any of the Indian literatures or scriptures before the advent of the Muslims to India. And according to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who wrote the book, Discovery of India, on page number 74 and 75 he writes that the earliest occurrence of this word Hindu can be traced to a tantric of 8th century CE. Means the first time the word Hindu was used was in the 8th century in the Christian era in a tantric in a scripture. And it was used to describe the people. It was never used for describing the followers of a particular religion. Its relationship to religion is of late occurrence. The word Hinduism is derived from the word Hindu and it was first time used by the Englishmen, by the Westerners, by the Britishers to describe a group of beliefs and faiths of the people of India. According to the new Encyclopedia Britannica, volume number 20, reference number 581, it says that the word Hinduism was first used by the British writers in the year 1830 to describe the religion and the belief of the people of India. Since the word Hinduism was first coined by the Englishman, it's an English word, today the Hindu scholars, they object and they say that Hinduism is a misnomer. The right word for the religion should be Sanatan Dharam, that is eternal religion, or Vedic Dharam, that is the religion of the Vedas. And according to Swami Vivekananda, Hinduism is a misnomer. The followers should be called as Vedantist. That means the followers of the Vedas. So in short, the word Hindu is a geographical definition used for describing the people of India. Its relationship to religion is of late occurrence. The word Hinduism was first used in 1830 by the British writers. It's an English word. And the word Sanatan Dharam, Vedic Dharam, and Vedantist is more appropriate, but these two are nowhere to be found in any Indian scriptures. All these words have come into existence in the past two centuries. Let's understand the definition of the word Islam. Islam comes from the word Salm, which means peace. It's also derived from Salm, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. Islam, in short, means peace obtained by submitting your will to Almighty God. And anyone who submits his will to Almighty God, religion of Islam. In fact, Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on this earth. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of this religion, but he is the last and final messenger of Almighty God, to whom was revealed the last and final message, the glorious Quran, 1400 years back. In this talk of mine today, I will not be speaking about those similarities between Hinduism and Islam, which is commonly known by most of the followers of both of these religions. I will not be speaking about both the religions say that you should speak the truth, that you should not tell a lie, that you should not be cruel, that you should be kind, that you should not steal. All these are known by the followers of both these religions. In fact, I will be speaking about those similarities which are not known commonly by both the followers of these religions. First, we'll discuss the similarities between Hinduism and the pillars of Iman, of faith in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 177, Allah says that it is not righteousness that you turn your face to the east or west, but it is righteousness that you believe in Allah, 
you believe in the last day that you believe in his angels his books and his messengers there's a hadith which is mentioned in Sahih Muslim word number one in the book of Iman chapter number two hadith number six a person approaches the Prophet and asks him what is Iman and the Prophet replies Iman is believing in Allah in God in his angels his books his meeting his messengers in the resurrection that life after death and in Qadr that is destiny so basically there are six pillars of Iman in Islam the first is believing in God second is believing in his angels third is believing in his books fourth is believing in his messengers fifth is believing in the direction that is hereafter that is life after death and sixth is believing in Qadr that is destiny first we'll discuss what Hinduism has to say about the first pillar concept of God if you ask the common Hindu that how many gods does he believe in some may say three some may say ten some may say hundred some may say thousand while others will say 33 crores 330 million but if you ask this question to a learned Hindu who's well versed with the scriptures he will tell you that the Hindus should actually believe and worship only one Almighty God but the common Hindu he believes in a philosophy known as pantheism the common Hindu believes that everything is God the tree is God the Sun is God the moon is God the human being is God the snake is God what we Muslims believe that everything is God's G-O-D with an apostrophe S everything belongs to God the tree belongs to God the Sun belongs to God the moon belongs to God the human being belongs to God the snake belongs to God so the major difference between the Hindus and the Muslims is the common Hindu says that everything is God we Muslims say everything is God's G-O-D with an apostrophe S the major difference is the apostrophe S if we can solve this difference of apostrophe S the Hindus and the Muslims will be united how do we do it as the Quran says come to common terms as us and you which is the first term Allah na'buda illallah that we believe in only one almighty God let us try and understand what the Hindu scriptures have to say about almighty God it is mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad chapter number six section number two verse number one it says ikkam evidityam it's a Sanskrit quotation which means God is only one without a second it is mentioned in the Chetashvatar Upanishad chapter number six verse number nine Nachasya Kasij Janita Nachadipa of him there are no parents he has got no lords Almighty God has got no mother he has got no father he has got no master he has got no superior it's mentioned in the Shetashvatar Upanishad chapter number four verse number 19 of him there is no likeness it's further mentioned in the Shetashvatar Upanishad chapter number 4 verse number 20 that his form cannot be seen no one can see him with the eyes amongst all the Hindu scriptures the most widely read and the most popular is the Bhagavad Gita it's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita chapter number 7 verse number 20 all those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires they worship demigods which means all materialistic people they worship demigods that is the false gods besides the one true almighty God it's further mentioned in Bhagavad Gita chapter number 10 verse number 3 that he who knows me as the unborn the beginningless the supreme lord of all the worlds amongst the Hindu scriptures the most sacred are the Vedas it's mentioned in the Yajur Ved chapter number 32 verse number 3 Nartasti Pratima Asti of him there are no images almighty God has got no images and further says that he is unborn he alone should be worshipped it's mentioned in Yajur Ved chapter number 40 verse number 8 that almighty God is imageless and pure it's mentioned in Yajur Ved 
chapter number 40, verse number 9. Andhatma pravishanti ya asambhuti mupaste. Andhatma means darkness. Pravishanti means entering. And asambhuti means the natural things like fire, water, air. It means they are entering darkness, those who worship the natural things like fire, water, air. And the verse continues, they are entering more in darkness, those who worship the created things like table, chair, idol, etc. Who says that? Yajurved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. It's further mentioned in the Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 58, verse number 3, Dev Maha Asi, verily great is Almighty God. And amongst the Hindu scriptures, the most sacred are the Rig Ved. It is mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 1, hymn number 164, verse number 46, the shlokas which were recited, by the respected pundits, it says, Ikkam sat vipra bahuda avidante. Ikkam sat vipra bahuda avidante. Which means, truth is one, God is one. Sages call him by various names. And the same message repeated in Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 114, verse number 5, that God is one, but sages call him by a variety of names. And in Rig Ved alone, in book number two, hymn number one, there are no less than 33 different attributes given to Almighty God, many of which were recited by the respected pundits. One amongst them in Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number one, verse number three, is Brahma. If you translate Brahma into English, it means the creator. If you translate into Arabic, it means Khalik. We Muslims have got no objection if someone calls Almighty God as Khalik or the Creator or Brahma. But if someone says Brahma is Almighty God who has got four heads and on each head is a crown, we Muslims take strong exception to it. Moreover, you are going against Shetash Vatarupanishad, chapter number four, verse number 19, which says, Na Tassipati Ma Asti. Of him, there is no likeness. Another attribute given in Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number one, verse number three, is Vishnu. If you translate Vishnu into English, it means the sustainer, it means the cherisher. If you translate into Arabic, it is somewhat similar to Rab. We Muslims have got no objection if someone says Almighty God is Rab, or Vishnu, or sustainer, or cherisher. But if someone says, Vishnu is Almighty God, who has got four hands, one of his right hand is the disc of the chakra, the other hand, he has the conch, he's traveling on the bird by the name of Garuda, or reclining on a couch of snakes, we Muslims take strong objection to it. Moreover, you're going against Yajurved. Chapter number 32, verse number three, which says, Na Tastipati Ma Asti. Of him, there are no images. If you read Rig Ved, all these descriptions are not given. The attributes are given that Almighty God is creator, he's sustainer, he's cherisher. We have no objection with attribute. But these images are not given because it is mentioned in the Vedas that Almighty God has got no images. It's further mentioned in Rig Ved, book number eight, hymn number one, verse number one, March the Nidhi Sansad. March the Nidhi Sansad, which means do not worship anyone except the one God. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number six, hymn number 45, verse number 16. Ya ik it mushtihi. Praise him alone, the one true God. And the Brahma Sutra of the Vedanta is ikkam braham dyutya naste, nehna naste kinchan, which means Bhagawan eki hai, dusra nahi hai, nahi hai, nahi hai, zara bhi nahi hai. There is only one God not a second, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So if we read the Hindu scriptures, we understand the concept of God in Hinduism. Let's try and understand the concept of God in Islam. The best reply any Muslim can give you regarding the concept of God in Islam is quote to you Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number one to four, which says, 
قل هو الله احد سي هي از الله وان اند اونلي الله الصمد الله دي ابسولوت اند ايترنال لم يلد ولم يولد هي بيجتس نوت نو از بيجوتن ولم يكن له كفوا احد اند ذير از ناثينج لايك هيم ذس از ا فور لاين ديفينيشن اوف المايتي جاد جيفن ان ذا جلوريس قران ان سوره اخلاص ويتش از ذا سيم as which was mentioned in the hindu scriptures the first is qul huwa allah ahad say he is allah one and only same as the chandogya upanishad chapter number 6 section number 2 verse number 1 which says ikam evidityam god is only one without a second the second was allah samad allah the absolute and eternal same as bhagavad gita chapter number 10 verse number 3 which says that He is the Lord of all the worlds. Verse number three: Lam yelid, walam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Same as Shetash Patar Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine, which says, "Na chasya kafij janita na chadipa," which means, Almighty God has got no parents. He has got no Lord. He has got no mother. He has got no father. And the last is. ولم يكن له كفوا احد there is nothing like him same as mentioned in the shetashvatar upanishad chapter number 4 verse number 19 as well as ajurved chapter number 32 verse number 3 which says na tasipati ma asti of him there is no likeness he has got no images the definition of almighty god given in quran and the hindu scripture is exactly the same this is the touchstone of theology surah ikhlas and what's quoted from the hindu scriptures is the touchstone of theology if anyone says that so and so candidate is god you put him to the test of surah ikhlas if that candidate passes the test he is a true almighty god if he doesn't he is not a true god for example some people say that bhagwan rajnish he is almighty god there was a hindu brother of ours during question answer time once he said that we hindus don't agree bhagwan rajnish is god i know that i never said that hindus say bhagwan rajnish is god i said some people say that bhagwan rajnish is god i've read the hindu scriptures nowhere do the hindu scriptures say that bhagwan rajnish is god but there are many people who have converted from different religions and now they say that bhagwan rajnish is god let us put bhagwan rajnish to the test of surah class and the test of the hindu scriptures the first is Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say it Allah one only. Ek kam evidityam. There's only one God without a second. Is Rajnish one and only? Is he the only man who has claimed divinity? There are many who have claimed divinity, especially in this country of ours. There are thousands of men who have claimed divinity. He's not the only one. But a Rajnish bhakti will say, no, he is unique. He is the only one. Let's go to the next test. Allah hu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. was rajnish absolute and eternal we know from his biography that he was suffering from asthma from diabetes from chronic backache imagine almighty god suffering from asthma from diabetes from chronic backache third test is lam yalid palam yulad he begets not no is begotten same as chandogya upanishad chapter number 6 section number 2 verse number 1 nachasya kasij janita na chadipa of him there are no parents no mother no father we know rajnish had a father and mother he was born in the state of madhya pradesh in 1981 he goes to america and takes thousands of americans for a ride and in the state of oregon he starts his town known as rajnishpuram later on the american government they arrest him and they put him behind bars and he claims that the american government gave me slow poisoning in the jail imagine almighty god being slow poisoned and later on in 1985 the american government they kick him out of the country he comes back to india and in the city of pune he restarts his center which is today known as the osho commune and if you go to pune and visit the center of the osho commune it is mentioned on his tombstone bhagwan rajnish osho rajnish never born never died but visited the earth from the 11th of december 1931 to the 19th of january 1990 never born never died 
but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. Never born, never died. They forgot to mention on his tombstone that he was not given visas to 21 different countries of the world. Imagine Almighty God coming in this world to visit the world and he requires visas to visit different countries. And the Archbishop of Greece said, if you don't remove Rajneesh out of this country, we'll burn his house and the house of his disciples. And the last test, walam yakullahu kufwan ahad. There's nothing like him. It's so stringent that no one besides the true almighty God can pass. The moment you can compare God to anyone in this world, in this universe, he's not God. Walam yakullahu kufwan ahad. We know Rajneesh. He was a human being like us. Had two eyes, one nose, two hands, two legs. Had a white beard. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. For example, if someone says that Almighty God is a thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You might have heard the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the person who got the title Mr. Universe, Mr. World, the strongest man in the world, the strongest man in the universe. If someone says that Almighty God is a thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger, the moment you can compare God to anyone, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger, whether it be Dara Singh, or whether it be King Kong, whether it be a thousand times, or whether it be a million times, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. There's nothing like him. My request is to my dear brothers and sisters, whichever God you're worshipping, put them to the test of Surya class and the test of the Hindu scriptures. If they pass the test, they are true almighty God. If they fail, they are not. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, the ayat which was recited by the Qari, Qulidullah Abidur Rahman, Ayyama Tadu, Falal Asma al Husna. Say, call upon him by Allah or by Rahman, by whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. And there are no less than 99 different attributes given to Almighty God in the glorious Quran. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Hakim, most gracious, most merciful, most wise, no less than 99. And the crowning one is Allah. Why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God? Because a person cannot play mischief with the Arabic word Allah as you can do with the English word God. For example, if you add S to God, it becomes God's. That's plural of God. There's nothing like plural Allah. Kul hu Allah ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. If you add D E S S to God, it becomes goddess, meaning a female God. There's nothing like male Allah or female Allah. Allah has got no gender. He's unique. If you add father to God, it becomes Godfather. He's my Godfather. He's my guardian. There's nothing like Allah Father or Allah by in Islam. If you add mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There's nothing like Allah Ammi or Allah Mother in Islam. Allah is a unique word. If you add tin before God, it becomes tin God, meaning fake God. There's nothing like tin Allah in Islam. That's the reason we Muslim, we prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. But if there are some Muslims who, while speaking with the non-Muslims about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these non-Muslims may not know the concept of Allah, so if they use the word God instead of Allah like how I'm doing today, there's no problem. But I'd like to remind that God is not the appropriate translation of the Arabic word Allah. And this word Allah is mentioned in all the sacred scriptures of the major world religion, including Hinduism. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number one, verse number 11. He's referred as Ilah, or Allah, meaning God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also mentioned by name in Rig Ved, book number three, hymn number 30, verse number 10, as well as Rig Ved, book number nine, hymn number 67, verse number 30. He has been mentioned by name as Allah in several verses of the Vedas. Let's try and understand 
the second pillar of Iman, that is the angels. As far as Hinduism is concerned, there is no particular concept of angels in Hinduism, but Hinduism, they have certain superhuman beings which do work which a normal human being can't do. In Islam, angels are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. And they are created from light. They do not have a free will of their own. They obey all the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have been appointed certain duties. For example, Archangel Gabriel, he has been appointed to get the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the messengers of Almighty God. Let's discuss the third pillar of Iman, that is the books. First, we'll discuss the books in Hinduism. The books in Hinduism are divided into two broad categories, the Shrutis and the Smritis. The Shruti means something which is revealed, which is heard, which is perceived, which is understood. The Shrutis, by the Hindu scholars, they are considered to be of divine origin, to be the word of God. And they are the most superior. They are divided into the Vedas and the Upanishads. The word Veda is derived from Sanskrit word Vid, which means knowledge. So Vedas means knowledge par excellence. These are the Holy Vedas, the most sacred. And there are principally four Vedas. We have the Rig Ved, which deals with the songs of praises. We have the Yur Ved, which deals with the sacrifice formulas. We have the Sam Ved, which deals with melody. and the Atharva Ved, which deals with magical formulas. Vedas are the most authentic and the most sacred among the Hindu scriptures. And these Vedas, the exact date when they were written or when they were revealed is not known. According to Swami Dayanil Saraswati of Arya Samaj, he says that the Vedas are 1,310 million years old. But according to the majority of the scholars, they say that the Vedas are approximately 4,000 years old. The exact date is not known. To whom it was revealed or who compiled it is not known. Where it came into existence the first time in the world, it's not known. But yet, the Vedas are considered to be of divine origin, the word of God, and they are the most sacred amongst all the Hindu scriptures. Next we have, we have the Upanishads. There are more than 200 Upanishads, but our Indian culture puts a figure of approximately 108. And there are some important Upanishads. Some say 10, some say 12, some say 18. This Upanishad, which is translated by Radha Krishna, he says there are 18 principal Upanishads. Next, we have the Smritis. Smriti means memory, that which is remembered. And these Smritis, they are less authentic, less sacred as compared to the Shrutis, the Vedas and Upanishads. And they are not of divine origin. The Hindu scholars say they have been written by men for the guidance of the human being, how a life should be led. They are also referred as the Dharma Shastra. Among the Smriti, we have the Itihas. The epics. We have the two great epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata. Ramayana is an epic which deals with the story of Sri Ram, which most of us Indians, we are aware of it. Then we have the Mahabharata. Mahabharata talks about a feud between the cousins, the Pandavas and the Kauravas. It also deals with the story of Sri Krishna. And all of us are aware about the story of Mahabharata. Then we have the Bhagavad Gita. 
it is an advice given by Shri Kishan to Arjun in the battlefield and it is a part of Mahabharat. It contains 18 chapter from the Bhishma Parva of Mahabharat from chapter number 25 to chapter number 42. It contains totally 18 chapters. Next, amongst the Hindu scriptures, we have the Puranas. We deal with the stories of deities, the creation of the universe. It is compiled into 18 voluminous parts by Maharishi Vyas. And most important amongst the Puranas is the Bhavishya Purana. This is the Bhavishya Purana, which talks about the future. There are various other scriptures of the Hindus. We cannot name all. Another one is the Manusmriti, the laws of the Hindus, which are written by Manu. So in short, these were the scriptures the books of Hinduism, but the major are the Vedas. If anything contradicts with the Vedas, the Vedas should be followed. They are the most sacred amongst all the Hindu scriptures and they are considered to be of divine origin. Let's discuss the books in Islam. It's mentioned in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 38. It says, Walikulli ajlin kitab. In every age have we sent a revelation. There were several revelations sent by Almighty God on this earth. But the last and final revelation is the glorious Quran. And it is the most sacred amongst all the Islamic scriptures. It was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 1400 years ago. It was revealed in Arabic. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Shuara, chapter number 26, was the 196 that it is assuredly mentioned in the revealed books of the previous people. That means Quran is mentioned in the revealed books of all the previous people. The other sacred books are the authentic hadith, the traditions and the sayings of the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. These are supplemented to the Quran. They are a commentary of the Quran. They will never conflict with the Quran. They will never overrule the Quran. This is Sai Bukhari, which is one of the authentic books, the sayings of the Prophet. Fourth pillar of Iman is the messengers of God. First we'll discuss the messengers of God in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 24. Wa in illa khalafiyan nazir. There is not a people without a warner having lived amongst them in the past. Allah says in the Quran that there were several messengers sent on the face of the earth. He also says in Surah Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 40. Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim rijalikum wa la khirasulallah wa khatam al nabiyin which means Muhammad peace be upon him is not the father of any of you men but he is a messenger of Allah and he is the seal of the prophets he is the last and the final messenger of Almighty God and Allah is all-knowing full of knowledge since Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he was not sent only for the Muslims or only for the Arabs Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107. Bama illa rahmat al That we have sent thee not, but at the mercy to the whole of humanity, at the mercy to all the worlds, at the mercy to all creatures. The message is repeated in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, where Allah says, Bama arsalnaka illa kafatal lil nas bashira wa nazira that we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger giving glad tidings and warning them against sin but most of the human beings yet do not know and a prophet said it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari point number one in the book of Salah chapter number 56 hadith number 429 the prophet said that 
all the previous messengers that came before me, they were only sent for their people. But I have been sent for the whole of humanity. Let's discuss the concept of messengers in Hinduism. The common Hindus, they have a different concept. They believe in avatar. The word avatar is derived from av, which means down, and tra, which means pass over. So avatar means to descend down, to come down. And according to Oxford Dictionary, it says that avatar means in Hindu mythology, a deity or a revered soul coming down on the earth in bodily form. So common Hindus, they believe that avatar means almighty God coming on this earth as a human being. And this concept, they derive from Bhagavad Gita, chapter number four, verse number seven and eight, which says, Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyutaranam dharmasya tatatmanam shrajya mayham. It's a very common verse. We hear it on the television in the serial of Mahabharat, which means that whenever there is decay of religion, O Bharata, and rise of unrighteousness, I manifest myself, verse number eight says, to protect the good and for the destruction of the evil. And to establish righteousness, I will be born in every age. Some bhavami yuge yuge. I will be born in every age. This message is also repeated in the Bhagavad Purana. Khan 9, Adhyay 24, Shloka 56. It says that whenever there is decay of righteousness and rise of sinfulness, I incarnate myself. But this concept of avatar, which most of the common Hindus believe in, it is nowhere to be found in the Vedas, the most sacred amongst all the Hindu scriptures. Therefore, the scholars of Veda, they say that the concept of avatar as believed by the common Hindu is different because avatar is a Sanskrit word which is possessive of Almighty God. It doesn't mean God Almighty has come himself down. It is possessive. Therefore, it refers to a man who Almighty God has sent. And if you read the Vedas, nowhere in the Vedas is the concept of avatar present. But the Vedas speak about saintly men, about rishis who Almighty God has sent to guide the humankind. This is exactly the same as the Islamic concept that Almighty God chooses a man amongst men and communicates with them on a higher level. And these men who Allah has sent to guide the human beings are called as messengers or prophets of Almighty God. So if you consider the Vedic concept, it is similar to the Islamic concept that Almighty God has sent chosen men who we call as prophets or messengers. Let's discuss what do the Hindu scriptures have to speak about the last and final prophet, the Antim Rishi. It's mentioned in the Bhavishya Purana, Parvatri, Khandatri, Adhyay 3, Shlokas 10 to 27. It says that the Malachas have spoiled the land of the Arabs. There is an enemy who's causing mischief. I will send a man by the name of Muhammad to defeat these enemy and to guide the people. Oh Raja, you need not go to the foolish land of Pishachas. I, with my grace, will purify you here. A person of injured disposition comes to Raja and says, Arya Dharma will prevail in the world. The religion of truth will prevail in the world. I have been sent by Ishwar Paramatma and my followers will be those who will be circumcised, who will not have a shandy, a tail on the head. They will grow a beard. They will create a revolution. They will give the call for prayers. They will eat all lawful things, but will not eat the flesh of swine. They will not be purified by herbs or shrubs, but will be purified by warfare. They will be called Muslim. They will be a creed of meat eaters. Now this prophecy, if you analyze, refers to no one 
but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It says that the enemies will be defeated by a man called as Muhammad. His name is mentioned, peace be upon him. And he will guide the people. And we know Prophet Muhammad led the Arabs from darkness to light. It further says that the followers of this Prophet, referring to the Muslims, they will be people who are circumcised. They will not have a tail on the head. They will grow a beard. They will create a revolution. They will give the call for prayer that the Azan. They will eat all lawful things, but will not eat the flesh of swine. They will not be purified by herbs and shrubs, but by warfare. They will be called Musalman. They will be a community of meat eaters. All these prophesies no one but Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his followers, the Muslims. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been prophesied in several places in Bhavishya Punana. Time doesn't permit us to go into the details. I'll just give a reference of a couple. He's prophesied in Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhe 3, Shlokas 5 to 8. He's also prophesied in Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khand 1, Adhe 3, Shlokas 21 to 23. The Prophet Muhammad has even been prophesied in several places in the Atharva Ved. It's mentioned in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 127, shlokas 1 to 14. These are called as the Kuntup Suktas. Kuntup in Sanskrit means the hidden glands in the abdomen. Referring to the meanings of the shlokas are hidden, they will be known later on. Due to shortage of time, we'll just discuss the first four in brief. The first mantra says, he will be Narashansa. He will be Kaurama. He will be protected from 60,090 enemies. Mantra number two says, he will be a camel riding Rishi. Mantra number three says, he will be Mama Rishi. Mantra number four says, he is Vashvis Reb. The first mantra says, he is Narashansa. Narashansa in Sanskrit, it derived from the word nar, meaning a man or a person, and shansa means praiseworthy. How we know in Hindi we say prashansa? So shansa is the same thing. So nara shansa means a person who is praiseworthy. And if you translate Muhammad, peace be upon him, from Arabic to English, it means the praiseworthy. So nara shansa is the Sanskrit translation of the Arabic word Muhammad, peace be upon him. The first mantra further says, he is Kaurama. One of the meaning of Kaurama, it means the Prince of Peace. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the Prince of Peace. The other meaning of Kaurama is an immigrant. And the Prophet migrated from Makkah to Medina. And the verse also says, he will defeat 60,090 enemies. And we know the population of Makkah that was against Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was approximately 60,000. Mantra number two says, he will be a camel riding Rishi, indicating he will not be an Indian Rishi, he will not be a Brahmin. Because Manusmriti, chapter number 11, verse number 202 says, a Brahmin cannot ride a camel or an ass. So this means it cannot be Indian Rishi, it cannot be a Brahmin, it has to be a foreign Rishi, a foreigner. Mantra number three says, he is Mama Rishi, also meaning Maharishi, means a great Rishi. Or some places it says Muhammad, that's the name of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The fourth mantra says, he is Reb. Reb means one who praises. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was also called as Ahmad, may peace be upon him. Which means one who praises, and the Prophet was called the one who praises, which is the translation of the Sanskrit word, Reb. He has been prophesied in several other places in the Atharva Ved. He's also prophesied in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 6. It says that a karu, meaning the praiseworthy man, he will defeat 10,000 enemies without a battle. This refers to the Battle of Azab, Battle of Khandak which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we know that he was the one who was praiseworthy. And he won the battle of Khandak, battle of Azab, 
in which the enemies were approximately 10,000 without the battle being fought. He's also prophesied in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 7, saying that the Abandu, by God's help, will defeat 20 chiefs. Abandu means an orphan. It also means one who praises. Both of this refer to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he will defeat 20 chiefs. We know from history that approximately in Makkah, there were approximately 20 tribes. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he won the battle of Makkah and defeated all these 20 chiefs. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is even prophesied in Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 53, verse number nine. The same prophecy, but the word is changed. It's called as Sushrama. And Sushrama again means one who praises the translation of the word Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is also prophesied in the Psalm Ved in Agni Mantra number 64. It says that he will not be fed by his mother. His mother will not breastfeed him. And after that, he'll become a prophet. And we know it was Arab custom that the children are normally breastfed by the wet nurse. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was breastfed by Halima. May Allah be pleased with her. There are various prophecies of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in several places in the Vedas. He is also prophesied in some way in Uttarchik mantra number 1500. It says that Ahmad will be given the eternal law. Ahmad, as I mentioned earlier, is another name for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, meaning one who praises. He will be given the eternal law, referring to the Quran. Some way says he has been given the eternal law. But since Ahmad is a non-Sanskrit word, the translators could not understand what is the meaning of Ahmad. So they broke the word into Ah and Miti. And now they translate as I alone. So it means I alone have been given eternal law. So if we read the translation, it says, I alone have been given the eternal law, but actually it should read as Ahmad has been given the eternal law. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been prophesied as Ahmad in several places in the Vedas. He's also prophesied in the Vedas, in some way, in Indra, mantra number 152. He's prophesied in Yajur Ved, chapter number 31, verse number 18. He's prophesied in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 6, verse number 10. In Atharva Ved, book number 8, hymn number 5, verse number 16. In Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 126, verse number 14. In several places, he has been prophesied as Ahmad, which was another name of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the one who praises. Furthermore, the last and final messenger has been prophesied as Narashangsa in several places in the Vedas. As I mentioned earlier, Narashangsa is derived from the word Nar, meaning a person or man, and Shansa as Prashansa means the praiseworthy, a man who's praiseworthy, which is exactly the translation of the Arabic word Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been prophesied as Narashangsa, as Muhammad, peace be upon him, in several places in the Vedas. He's prophesied in Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 13, verse number three, in Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 18, verse number nine, in Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 106, verse number four, in Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 142, verse number three, in Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number three, verse number two, in Rig Ved, book number five, hymn number five, verse number two, in Rig Ved, book number seven, hymn number two, verse number two, in Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 64, verse number three, in Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 182, verse number two, in Yajur Ved, chapter number 20, verse number 37, Yajur Ved, chapter number 20, verse number 57, Yajur Ved, chapter number 21, verse number 31, Yajur Ved, chapter number 21, verse number 55, Yajur Ved, chapter number 28, verse number 2, Yajur Ved, chapter number 28, verse number 19, Yajur Ved, chapter number 28, verse number 42. You can keep on quoting only references. He's been mentioned as Narashansa in several places in the Vedas. You can only give a talk for several hours together about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mentioned in the Hindu scriptures. 
I'll just mention another one last prophecy. He has been prophesied as the Kalki Autar, the final Autar, the Antim Rishi. It's mentioned in the Puranas about the Kalki Autar, about his coming. It's mentioned in the Bhagavata Purana, Khan 12th Adhyay 2, Shlokas 18 to 20. It says that in the house of Vishnu Yash, the revered priest, Brahmin priest, of the village of Sambhala will be born the Kalki Avatar. It further says that he will be Lord of the worlds and he will have unsurpassed qualities and character. He will be given specially eight criteria and he will be given by the angels a steed horse, a fleet horse and he will ride a white horse with the sword in his hand. He will defeat the miscreant, the evil people, and he will be savior to the world. It further says in Bhagavad Purana, Khan 1, Adhyaya 3, Shloka 25, that in Kali Yug, where kings become robbers, there will be a savior who will be born in the house of Vishnu Yash. His name shall be Kalki. He's even prophesied in the Kalki Purana, chapter number two, verse number four, that in the house of Vishnu Yash, the chief of the village of Sambhala will be born Kalki Avatar. Kalki Purana, chapter number two, verse number five says that he will, along with four companions, defeat the evil people. Kalki Purana, chapter number two, Verse number seven says that he will be helped by the angels in the battlefield. Kalkya Purana, chapter number two, verse number 11 says that in the house of Vishnu Yash, in the womb of Sumati, the Kalkya Avatar will be born. And further says in Kalki Purana, chapter number two, verse number 15, that he will be born on the 12th of the first half of the month of Madhav. Now all these prophecies refer to no one but the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Point number one, he will be born in the house of Vishnu Yash. That means his father's name will be Vishnu Yash. And we know that the name of the father of prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was Abdullah. Vishnu Yash means the follower, the obedient, of Vishnu and Abdullah means the obedient, the worshipper of Almighty God. His mother's name will be Sumati. Sumati in Sanskrit means one who's peaceful. And the name of Prophet Muhammad mother was Amina, which also means peaceful. It says he will be born in the village by the name of Sambala. Sambala in Arabic means a place which is of peace and security. And we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was born in Makkah, which is also called as Darul Aman, which means a place of security and peace. It further says that he will be born in the house of the chief of Sambala. And we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in the house of the chief of Makkah. It further says he will be born on the 12th day of the first half of the month of Madhav. And we know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was born on the 12th of the first half of the month of Rabbi Awal. It further says that the Kalki Avatar, he will be an Antim Rishi, the last Rishi. And we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the last and final messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as is mentioned in Surah Ahzab, chapter 33, verse number 40. It further says that he will receive guidance from Parshuram in the mountain and then he'll go towards the north and come back. We know he received the first guidance to Archangel Gabriel in Garahira, in Jabal Nur, that is the mountain of light. And later he migrated from Makkah, that is northwards, and he comes back to Makkah later. It further says that he will have qualities which are unsurpassed in character, as Allah says in the Quran, in 
chapter number 68, verse number 4, it says that verily thou art standeth on the highest standard of character. Thou art standeth on the highest standard of character. It further says that this Kalki Avatar will be given eight special qualities, referring to he will be wise, he'll have self-control, he'll have respectable lineage, he will also have revealed knowledge, he'll have valor and strength, he will have measured speech, he will have the qualities of being charitable, and he will also be very kind. All these eight criteria and characteristics refer to no one but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It fits his character exactly. It further says that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he will be given the steed horse by Shiva. And we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given the Burak, the Almighty God, by which he went to Miraj, the ascension to heaven. It further says he will ride a white horse and will have the sword in the right hand. We know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he took part in most of the battles, most of which were in self-defense. He took active part, he even rode the horse and had the sword in the right hand. It further says that he will be a savior of humankind. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 24, and Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, it says, Wama arsalnaka, that we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to the whole of humankind. And he has been sent as a guidance to the whole humankind. But most of the men yet do not know. He's also said that he will guide the people to the right path. And we know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was the days of Yom al and he guided them from darkness to light. It further says that he will be supported by four companions who will spread the message. And we know the four companions mentioned refer to Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, and Hazrat Ali. May Allah be pleased with them all. And it further says that he will be helped by the angels in the battlefield. And we know in the battle of Badr, Angels helped Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to win the battle. It's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse 123 and 125. It's also mentioned in chapter number 8, verse number 8 and 9. These prophecies undoubtedly refer to no one but the last and final messenger of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's been referred as the last Rishi, Antim Rishi, the last and final messenger of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Let's discuss the fifth pillar of Iman, that is believing in life after death, believing in the year after. First, we'll discuss life after death in Hinduism. The common Hindu, he believes in the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, known as samsara, the theory of reincarnation. And this theory of reincarnation says that Almighty God has created different people in different ways. Some are born rich, some are born poor, some are born healthy, some are born with some congenital defect. So how could God be unjust in making different people born in different ways? So they came out with the theory of samsara, also known as theory of reincarnation or transmigration of soul. Based on the verse of Bhagavad Gita, chapter number four, verse number 22, which says, whenever a person changes his clothes and wears new clothes, it is somewhat similar, like a soul gives away the body and enters new body. It believes in the theory of karma. The actions that you do are the karma. If you do good actions, you'll be rewarded in this world or the year after. If you do bad actions, you'll get a punishment. They also believe in the theory of dharma. Dharma means a person should live life according to the guidance of Almighty God. If you do good dharma, then your karma also will be good. And they believe in moksha. That means free from the cycle of birth, 
death and rebirth. If you analyze that this concept of transmigration of souls or samsara is no way mentioned in the Vedas. What the Vedas speak is about the punar janam. Punar means next or again. Janam means life. So punar janam means next life or life again. It doesn't mean life, death and life again. It's not cycle of birth, death and rebirth. It's only next life or life again. So the Hindu scholars who believe in the Vedas, they say that the concept of transmigration of soul was never mentioned in the Vedas. It came into existence later on. What is mentioned in the Vedas, if you read Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 16, verse number 4 and 5, it speaks about the next life and also says you will go to paradise, but doesn't speak about death, life and death. Further, if you analyze the Vedas and the other Hindu scriptures, they talk about swarg, about heaven, and describe heaven that it is a very beautiful place where rivers will flow, there will be rivers flowing of milk, and there will be various fruits, it will be a place which is good. It even talks in several places in the Vedas, in Atharva Ved, in Rig Ved. The Vedas even speak about Nark, that is hell. The description is somewhat like fire. And it says that this fire of hell will be bad and a person won't be able to bear the pain in hell. So the concept of hell and heaven is there. But the concept of death, birth and death is not there anywhere in the Vedas. Because the human beings, the scholars, they could not know how could some people be born healthy, some people born with congenital defect. So because of this, we find that this concept have come about the birth, death and rebirth. 